and I got a call, unexpected call from a good friend of mine, and he said, it is a shock. So I said, what's, what's a shock? And he said, the Chinese have taken over. And just then the line cut out. <laughs> After a minute, he called back and he said, I'm standing at the Shanghai Auto Show and I cannot believe my eyes. He said, it's a revolution and the global automakers are in big trouble. I don't think people in the West and especially here in the United States have any idea about the power and capability of China's auto industry today because we don't see Chinese cars on American roads. And in hundreds of countries around the world, you're finding record numbers of Chinese cars. In fact, this year, how many of us knew that China became the single largest export of cars worldwide, blowing past Japan? Largest producer of vehicles, largest seller of vehicles, builds more electric vehicles than the rest of the world combined. Batteries, number one and number two in the world. Battery supply chains, critical minerals, low cost, high quality. I mean, it's almost like terrifying just how strong a position China is in. Think of it as sort of like the Godzilla of the auto industry destroying everything as fast. Way out in front of everyone else is BYD. They account for 40% of total EV production inside China, and they've got the full spectrum of vehicles. This is interesting. Chinese, uh, led by Geely and SEIC, have bought Western brands and done very well with them. There was no chance to grow a company quickly in the U.S. I raised a total of $350 million. Half of that came from the Chinese government in forgivable loans. I applied to the U.S. government when we had a big infiltration of big, 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 big grants during the Obama administration. We lost. And when my competitors in the U.S. got $600 million and I got nothing, you have no choice. As a scientist, as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, you have to decide who is boss. And in my case, climate change is boss, innovation is boss, and we let the company basically expand in China. And it was quite successful. We built actually the first gigafactory in this industry in the Shanghai corridor with welcomed arms from the administration. So I think too, how do we get there? It was a consistent message that batteries are critical to electronics, to AI, to transportation, mobility on all levels, from scooters to complex buses. What did China do so incredibly well? They put the innovators together. So you gave opportunities. So you had a cool company, you had a cool company, I have a cool, and we have all cool companies. The Chinese government would say, hey, you guys, come and play in this area right here together. And you all benefit, and if you win together, you win large contracts together. We need to build energy resiliency. We need to build manufacturing resiliency. That is not declaring trade wars. That is not diversifying out of supply chains where we have been for the last 30 years. We are not divorcing. We're just lessening our dependence. I think it's critical. I, I think that message is very powerful. For China tech over the past 15 years, I was lucky to have a front row seat uh, in that scene. And uh, a couple of years later, um, of course, um, Grab became another success story coming out of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, the company valuation was already $1 billion at Series B when my team represented GGV Capital to uh, invest in Grab. This is the f one of the first companies where the service is uh, mobile only, and they don't know what to do. And then as a uh, lawyer, we would tell the investor, of course, this is a critical legal risk, but having said that, uh, we do not see the government cracking down on the company because we're talking about 2012, 2013, the late Chinese uh, Prime uh, Minister Li Keqiang, who just passed away and created a lot of uh, uh, mourning and sentiment in China, in part because people miss the, um, you know, what happened during the first uh, 20, 30 years of uh, opening and reform. And his uh, passing away a week ago was an embodiment of the end of that era. Uh, that concludes the cycle of uh, the, what I call the Gilded Age of uh, China tech. Benjamin, when we chatted the other day, you mentioned that several Chinese companies are almost disguising themselves to not appear Chinese. So tell us maybe a little bit about what, right. what's Timu? Uh, Timu is uh, one of the subsidiaries of uh, Pinduoduo, right? the, a Chinese um, e-commerce company. 
they also disguise themselves as a non-Chinese company, as a, if I remember correctly, as a Singapore company. So I guess the point is, uh, it's not just um, foreign investors or foreign companies losing confidence or being nervous about the China market. It's Chinese entrepreneurs themselves, you know, concerned. And uh, that really, uh, that's another completion of a cycle. Let's look forward a little bit. Mike, first to you, your reflections on what we just talked about and where, where it's going. If I may just look at the auto industry for the last 30 years, the whole theme was global automakers descending on the very promising, profitable, and fast-growing China market. That's over. No one's making money in the China market, and the global automakers are losing share and money. For the first time, Chinese automakers are sitting on massive capacity at home in a weak excess market. Excess capacity. A massive excess capacity. Put a number to it, 40 million cars a year, roughly half of the total demand globally sits in China. They now use about 30 million of that. So they have 10 million extra. Guess what they're doing with their factories are saying, get new markets globally. And so all of a sudden it gets very interesting because from the perspective of the Europe and the United States, we have the markets. That's gold to these Chinese manufacturers. That's our leverage. So we have to make big calls on how do we let them in? Right now there's a 27.5% import duty on Chinese cars coming to the United States. Do we let them in as manufacturers? Do we let them partner? Big questions. This country should turn the table. Um, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, um, at least for the time being, pessimism in the economy about China. Entrepreneurs and investors in China are just depressed, completely depressed. And um, if um, you know their their money, uh, people, and technology want to go somewhere else. It's potentially America's and or other Western allies gain, and but they want to, they need to want it. Just like uh, the the past the twenty years of um, China development was largely a story of porting U.S. especially Silicon Valley money, talent, technology to China, and um, if Chinese, um, you know, car or, or battery companies have better stuff, um, just do what China did to you know absorb all these uh, Western. Uh, money and technology, of course, uh, with uh, national security in mind, uh, but, um, you know, let them in. I think this comes back to we stand on the shoulders of previous generations all the time. The United States has a choice. To me, it is go forward and don't be so vulnerable. Play into the kindness, the collaboration, and the opportunity for leadership. Bell Labs, I mentioned before, is a great success story. Innovators from all over the world. Frankly, MIT is one of these success stories. You walk that long corridor and you meet the world every day. I love it. That is amazing. We live in peace. We come up with ideas. We don't care so much how if we have broken accents or funny looks. We live for the ideal. We are mission-oriented problem solvers. That's the core of the winning characteristic, I believe, for the future. We cannot get into protect the borders, crush everybody. That's a stupid mindset. Let's go for opportunities, leadership, kindness, generosity. These are core values that we understand and that we now must deploy. Mike, Christina, Benjamin, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.